Okay. We're now we are recording. All right. So learning outcomes are to relate the history of the study of human development, <clears throat> compare and contrast theories of human development, enumerate key controversies in human development, and then describe ways in which researchers study human development. Okay. So developmental psychology studies development of humans in the following areas physical, cognitive, social, and emotional. So as we go over this textbook, just like that human development chart that I showed you guys, each age group will discuss all of these contents, right? So for um, infancy, we'll talk about infancy and physical development, infancy and cognitive development, infancy and social emotion and emotional development. And then we'll go into um, toddlers or whatever, what's the next stage, right? Um, child development, um, uh, adolescence, adulthood, uh, early adulthood, every age group will talk about physical, cognitive, social, and emotional throughout this whole textbook. That's your, your lifespan, um, that developmental chart. You're going to be filling this stuff in. This is the main content that you really want to make sure you know for each of those age groups. So they focus on the influences on behavior. The biggest thing of takeaway of this, this everything in this textbook talks about behavior um, for all the age groups, but influence, right? Influences everybody and everything around us is an influence to us. So many, many, many years ago in ancient times and in, in middle ages, children were actually seen as an innately evil and discipline and the discipline was harsh. Like parents actually believed that their children were evil and they disciplined them harsh. As soon as they were old enough to do stuff, they were giving them chores and putting them out on the field to work. They weren't, they weren't educated. Um, and they, they believed that children were just bad. Um, it wasn't until John Locke and John Jacuz, um, these theorists came along and they, they created, they came along and said, no, children are not evil. They actually um, come into this world as blank slates. They're a blank tablet, they're blank, right? But they become, um, it says, Rasu argued that children were inherently good. So he actually says that they're blank tablet and they come in as good people. We are what make them bad and evil because they learn from us. So this is how the theories um, on children became and then all these laws came into place to protect children. But before that, children were being abused and, and used by their parents um, and it was seen as normal. So during the industrial revolution, childhood was seen as a special time of life. In the 20th century, laws were passed because of these theorists to protect children from abuse by their parents and other adults. So various thoughts about child development merged into a field of scientific study. Then we had other theorists jump in, right? And um, so basically when they passed these laws, they said, no, children are not allowed to do manual labor. They need to be in school getting an education. And these laws said made parents take them off their farms and put them in school and take care of them properly. And the parents didn't think, know that that was what they were supposed to do because everyone, it, it was a tradition in family. So there, um, Janley, G. Stanley Hall, he founded that child development is an, um, as an academic discipline. So he started talking about school and that they needed to learn and they, they learn and become who they are by getting an education. Alfred Binet and Theodore Simon developed the first standardized intelligence test. It was meant to identify children who were at risk of falling behind with their peers in academic achievement. <clears throat> and the chapter will tell you more if you read when you read the textbook about the evil that they thought these children were. It's you you would never you wouldn't know or think that, um, but yes. And there's a lot of research on that as well. So the lifespan perspective is the view that human development occurs throughout one, per, one individual's lifetime. So every individual has develops over the course of their life. Trends in abilities throughout adulthood were young adulthood. Um, it was the time of peak physical development. 
Individuals perform at their best on complex intellectual tasks during midlife. People are most well-adjusted during late adulthood. And then we have the theories of development. So we have behavior, behaviorism and maturation. So behaviorism was founded by John B. Watson and he supported the nurture theory. So there's that nature versus nurture theory. And he talked about the nurture theory and it's the view that science must study observable behavior only and investigate relationships between stimuli and responses. So he's saying that um, watching a child basically is observing them, not interacting with them, not teaching them anything, not getting involved with them, but just observing how they react on their own based on the environment that they're placed in. That's what he said. Um, and then maturation, it was the idea held by Arnold Giselle, and it's the unfolding of genetically determined traits. Children are genetically formed to want to learn. Right? They come into this world and they start doing stuff. They start, they, they crawl on their own. They start doing these things on their own. And on, if we don't influence them, they will learn how to do a lot of things on their own. But then we, we need to help them, um, guide them the rest of the way. So these are some perspectives on human development. We have the psychoanalytic perspective, learning perspective, cognitive perspective, biological perspective, ecological perspective, social culture perspective, and then human diversity. And we'll talk about each of these. The psychoanalytic perspective consists of stage theories. So many of these theorists were what we, what we call stage theories. They believe that things that happen in people's lives didn't just happen in one moment. They happened in stages across their entire life. That's what a stage theorist is. So um, it's the theory of development characterized by distinct periods of their life. And that's basically what we just talked about, the, the infancy, toddler, um, adolescent. Those are the state, most of the stages, right? So the child's experiences during early stages affect the child's emotional and social life in the future. And theories, um, the theories of psychosexual development and then there's psychosocial development. Um, sorry, I'm just, okay. So psychosexual development is the process by which libidinal energy is expressed through various oregonous zones at different stages of development. It focused on emotional and social development and the origins of psychological traits in, in those, in each individual. So those psychological traits the id, the ego, and the superego. You may have heard of it before. Um, so the id is typically present at birth. It's basically an infant, a, a, a brand new baby coming into this world. They're saying that they're unconscious, right? They, they, they come in blank slates, birth, right? It represents biological drives and demands, instinct gratification. So their biological drive is to start doing stuff, to learn. It, they, it comes naturally to them. Um, but they also want instinct gratification. That's part of the id. Um, think about a baby who starts crying and they want something instantly. They don't want to wait for you to make that bottle. They're going to cry and cry and cry. You should have that bottle ready um, or have a pacifier handy. That's instant gratification, right? So that's an example of a baby. Everybody has id, ego, and superego, okay? And it develops starting at birth. And then the ego is the conscious sense of self. It, they, it seeks gratification by avoiding social disapproval. So think about yourself or a child looking in the mirror at the first for the first time and seeing themselves, right? It's a conscious sense of yourself, who you are, what you are, how you look, what you want to be. And as you get older, that ego develops because you decide what you want to be, who you want to be, um, what groups you want to be with, right? So that's your ego. And and you avoid avoid social, what they mean by avoiding social disapprovals is that. If you were on campus today and we walked into our class, right? Maybe you drove to the school and you were singing in your car. Something. This is an example, and um, you wouldn't walk into class doing that, right? 
because that's a social disapproval. People will look, might look at you and say, wait, what is this person doing? Right. So that's basically, you, you do things for yourself, but then when you're in a social environment, you, you're, you're, you have a different version of yourself and having an understanding of who you are in, in a certain environment and outside of that environment alone um, is important. And then we have the super ego. It internalizes the wishes and morals of a child's caregivers and behaviors of the ego. A person is filled with guilt and shame when the judgment is in a negative. So if you think about a child, right, with a super ego, or even an adult, if someone kind of puts you down or says something that you don't like, you might feel shame, feel guilt. You might feel, um, you know, upset about it. That's the super ego. It's it's your feel, basically your feelings on on responses from other people around you. You want, everybody wants to feel safe and welcoming and, and feel comfortable. And the what, where's the greatest place you feel safe? In your home. You, you're, you're most comfortable and feel safe. What about those children that don't have a home, right? Or those people that don't have a home. They don't feel safe. They don't have this. They don't have any form of, 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 of safety where they can just relax and feel comfortable. They're always on their toes. So this is where the super, super ego comes in um, and kind of teaches you how to protect yourself, how to make yourself feel safe. And those people, those children that are bounced around through forced to care um, or different families, th th not, that not feeling of safe teaches them to protect themselves and not trust people. But you who have a comfortable home, have your own safety, your own version of safety. And it develops over the course of your life, depending on your living situation, your household situation, the people around you, the caregivers, the people who raised you. Um, and it, it's different for everybody. Everybody's scenario is different. Nobody's is the same. So we also have what we call stages of psychosexual development. Again, a lot of these things are going to talk about stages. It's a lot of information. The oral stage is oral activities such as sucking and biting brings gratification. So the, this stage is in the beginning, infancy, when the, the baby is born, right? Um, the oral, um, it brings gratification, sucking, biting, a pacifier, a bottle, things like that. Then they develop into the anal stage, which is Gratification is obtained through discarding and controlling waste products, going to the bathroom. Um, that's the anal stage. Um, and as children start to learn potty training, this is kind of where that's developing a little bit more, right? So they they kind of start to understand their own bowels, their own what's going on in their body. Um, and then phallic stage is development of parent-child conflict over masturbation. That's when we're getting into the teenage years and a child is starting to pay attention to their own body and their own body parts and how they feel, um, things like that. And it can be different stages. It can be different. Um, it can happen in various stages too for eight. Everybody develops differently. Um, but children start paying attention, right? They, it, uh, if you have children at home, um, when, th when they're babies and they're toddlers, you don't care about maybe walking around, you know, uh, let them, letting them see you. But after a certain age, you, you're covering up, right? Because now they're going to start asking questions. That's kind of like that stage, the phallic stage. Then we have the latency stage where sexual feelings stay unconscious and children's attention shift um, to schoolwork and playmates. So they stop paying attention to the body parts and stuff like that for a while, because now they're starting into school age years, five years old, kindergarten, and their focus is on friends, playmates, schoolwork, Thing, thing, other other things that are going on outside of their home life. So that kind of gets put on pause. That latency stage is like is a staged pausing what what they call the sexual uh, gratification. And then as they get older again, they develop the genital stage. It's biological changes in adolescence which results in the desire to engage in intercourse. As those teen years, they're they're um, they're they're. Um, everything, their hormones are all over the place and they're experimenting and exploring with themselves, with other people, and they're learning more about themselves. So these are all the different stages and we will kind of talk about them more as we get into them in the chapters of those age groups. So 
Um, this is an evaluation of Freud's theory of psychosexual development. So they talk about positives and, and criticisms here. So the positives are that child care workers recommend that toilet training should not be started too early or handled punitively because it could it could kind of basically push the child back. If you try too early um, and you scare them, then they, they're going to end up having more accidents and they might not actually be potty trained until later on in life. Um, edu educators are more sensitive to emotional reasons behind a child's misbehavior because they're trained, they're taught to do those things. And some of the criticisms that come with Freud, because he was one of the very, very first theorists, some of the criticisms say that his theories are based on, on contact with adults only, adult patients, and that he didn't study enough children. Um, and they also say that the emphasis is placed on basic instincts and, and unconscious motives. So Freud was one of the very, very first theorists. He brought these things to light. He may not have always been right, but then all these other theorists came in and said, wait a minute, no, this is right. You're right, but let me fix this in advance and change the age groups. So he, his, his, his idea of his studies just needed to be advanced a little further. So that's where the criticisms came in. Um, and then Erickson, came in and he talked about the psychosocial development, which focuses on the development of emotional life and psychological traits on social relationships. He places an emphasis on ego and the sense of self. Each stage is characterized by social relationships and physical maturation and early experiences affect future development. So whether the experience, the early experiences in your childhood are good, then your future development is gonna be good. Early, bad early experiences are gonna make your, your development, uh, your, your future development may not come out and have a good outcome. Successful resolution of early life crisis bolsters a sense of identity, right? So if you have good, a good life in childhood, a good outcome, then you're going to have a successful, um, you're going to successfully identify yourself, right? So we have different types. Life crisis is the internal conflict that attends each stage of the psychosocial development. Every stage of development has some sort of life crisis. The concept of identity crisis has affected the way parents and teachers deal with children, especially as time develops and more things come into play, like technology. Identity crisis is the period of inner conflict during which one examines one values and makes decisions about one's life role. So they, they examine their values. Um, identity crisis can happen at any different points in their life. It can happen multiple times. It can happen one or two times, um, but they become, they. It, it starts in the teen years where they're trying to identify who they are as a human being. It places an emphasis on the importance of human conscious and choice, a portrayal of human beings as pro-social and helpful, and then some positive outcomes of early life crisis help put people on the path to positive development. And at any point, guys, if you get confused or you want me to repeat something or rephrase it, please stop me and ask questions um, so that we can make things clear, okay? Learning perspective behaviorism. So some of you may have heard of like um, Pavlov with the dog, um, the dog and the bell theory, um, which is basically where they, the dog, they, they gave the dog a bell and the, the dog learned, ring the bell and you'll get food. And the dog, it took a long time, but the dog had to keep learning to press the bell. And every time he pressed the bell, he got food. If he didn't press the bell, he didn't get food. So some theorists started studying animals first before they started studying, doing these studies on humans. And this is where classical, um, classical conditioning and operant conditioning comes into play. So classical conditioning is the original neutral stimulus, which elicits the response brought forth by a second stimulus. The neutral stimulus is repeated, repeatedly paired with the second stimulus. So um, they're given uh, someone to help them. So the stimulus is the child, let's say, for example. Um, and then they're given another child to teach them or, or adult to teach them the same material. 
to teach them this stuff. Um, but they, they're they learning, so they have to have a repeated stimulus given to them repeatedly, teaching them this material or so, so source before they learn how to do it themselves. That's classical conditioning. So like I said, the bell. The bell could be um, the stimulus. The bell for the dog was the stimulus. They repeatedly kept giving the dog the bell. He was one stimulus, and then the bell was the other. And eventually, um, the dog... They took the bell away and the dog didn't know how to get food, but the dog knew if someone else rang the bell that the food was coming. He knew to, to listen for the sound of the bell. So this is how these, this is classical conditioning. They conditioned um, people and, and dogs and animals to, to do things. Operant conditioning is the organism learns to engage in behavior that is reinforced. We actually undergo operant condition from, from really young. Think about a child, a child's first time going into kindergarten. At home, they just, it's play, 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 play based. And then all of a sudden they're stuck in a classroom and they have to sit there for eight hours a day in a chair. That's operant conditioning. We are conditioning and we've been, and then we're doing this for the rest of our lives, right? You go into a classroom in college and you're sitting in a desk in a chair. Um, that's conditioning. It, you, they, they put, put you in, in, a, in an environment and teach you how to be in that environment. And then you're conditioned to do exactly. And you already know what to do when you're put in that environment. You, they, they condition you to learn how to act in a certain environment. So classical conditioning is given, be, is given a second stimulus to help you where operant conditioning is more kind of like being put into an environment and learning how to act and be in that environment on your, um, whether you have, you, you walk into that environment and you see other people acting in that way, um, in a certain way, and then you just follow suit. That's what operant condition is. So this is a uh, kind of a little chart that they gave you the example I gave you with the bladder tension. Um, this, this is another example, bladder contention, but the example I gave you with the dog and the bell is, I think is a better example, but this is the before conditioning and the after conditioning. And in the before, um, it says bladder tension. It does not elicit waking up, but then they use the bell and then it makes you wake up. And then eventually, um, they take the bell away. So they keep doing this every day, um, reinforcing it, right? Conditioning you. And eventually they take away the bell and then you wake up with the, with the bladder attention. And this can be any form. They, this is one example. They give you, there's another example in the textbook. Um, there's multiple examples of videos online. Like I said, when I when I kind of in the discussion boards on Canvas, I'll maybe give you guys other videos to see different forms of it. Um, to keep you guys understanding it. So conditioning is based on, also based on reinforcements. So we have um, in behaviorism, we have what we call reinforcements, which is the process of providing a stimuli following responses that increase fluency, uh, frequency. So positive reinforcers increase the frequency of behaviors when they are applied. Think of positive reinforcers as um, you potty training a child, okay? Maybe the child is for the first time is learning to sit on the potty and go to the bathroom. And every time they use the potty, they get a sticker. That's a positive reinforcing. You're giving them something. They're getting a reward. A negative reinforcer um, increases the frequency of behavior when they when when something is removed. So um, maybe not so much in potty training, but think about um, maybe a child playing with a sibling and that child hits the other sibling, okay? Now they got in trouble, so you're going to take away one of their toys. They just lost something, maybe temporarily um, or for days or weeks, whatever it is, but they lost something because they hit their sibling, and every time they hit their sibling, something gets taken away. That's a negative reinforcement. Something gets removed. Eventually, they're going to learn I can't hit my sibling because I don't want to get my toy that I really love taken away. So positive reinforcement is being given something and negative reinforcement is being something being taken away. The extinction is the result that is that comes from the, those reinforcements. The result from repeated performance of operant behavior without reinforcement. So eventually, the goal is to remove the reinforcer and the child will behave in the way that you want them to. 
So I eventually the child does not need to um, need to get a sticker anymore. Now they know how to use the potty on their own and they no longer need to keep getting stickers every time they use the potty. You no longer need to take toys or things away from them because now they know that they just shouldn't hit their sibling. And you can use any example for this, right? But that's what a positive, this is my example of it. This is what a positive and negative reinforcer are. And the extinction is the outcome that you get once you take that reinforcement away. If you, your goal is to be able to take the reinforcement away. Does it so, matter which, sorry, does it matter which reinforcement, whether positive or negative? It depends on the situation, um, but no, it doesn't matter. The extinction is the result that you get. Um, and they, they and they vary based on situations, right? So you may not want to use a negative reinforcer on potty training because you might scare the child or make the child want like kind of draw back. Um, teachers do not use negative reinforcers. They're very against using negative reinforcers in school. Um, every because they believe in pun, pun, that's a punishment. That's a form of punishment in a, in a sense. Um, but it doesn't matter what which way. So they did these studies on animals first, same kind of studies in different forms, a positive reinforcer, a negative reinforcer, and they um, then eventually they started doing them on people, these studies. Um, and that's where, so it's kind of similar to conditioning. You're conditioning a behavior. You're, you're, you're creating a behavior that you want, right? Um, if you think about it, if you really want to go deep into thought about it, the laws that are put in place, the, 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 the things that we have in, in our life, that's a conditioning. They, they were we were taught this through positive and negative reinforcers from, from early on in life as children. And we just adapt. We're, we're all conditioned to be a certain way. Okay, so they give you lots, like I said, lots of different examples, right? So um, it says the use of positive reinforcement, the procedure, that's the behavior. And then the consequences says positive reinforces teachers approval if um, teacher approval if presented when, stu when students study. So the student studies for the exam and the teacher says, oh, wow, you did such a great job. So it increases the frequency of them studying because they want the teacher's approval. The negative reinforcement is the behavior of the study, and then it's a negative reinforcer. If the stu um, uh, if the student, uh, the teacher gives a disapproval, the disapproval is removed when the student studies. So the student's not studying, the teacher's probably saying, oh, that you, I, I don't understand why you just won't study or you don't pay attention. That's negative reinforcement. Eventually, they're gonna remove that negative reinforcement um, the disapproval and the student will start to study because they want to get positive reinforcement from the teacher. They want to hear good things. So they hear other people getting praise. So they want to get praise too. So they're going to start studying so that they can get good. This is an example. They don't really promote this in schools anymore. Some people do it. Um, but there's many, many different examples of where positive and negative reinforcement can be used. Um, and there's, if you Googled any video, you, you'll watch like hundreds of different examples of videos. Um, and then same thing. These, these are the same examples. So the use of negative reinforcement behavior, um, the negative reinforces the teacher's disapproval is removed when the student studies and it's in reverse. So you can change the behavior of the student um, by determining uh, a punishment or not, right? Detention. Uh, think about if a child uh, going to class. Actually, I think the next going forward, there's another slide which we'll get into. Um, if you don't come to class, um, you're not going to do well in the class because you're not getting the material, right? So I, I could tell you that now, right? So um, by you not been coming to the class, you're not doing well for yourself. So you are negative. You're not. You're doing. Is that's a negative reinforcement itself? Once I tell you, I keep telling you, come to class, come to class, study the material. You're going to hear me saying it over and over again. I'm positive reinforcing you to do it. And then you start doing it. Now you're, you're increasing the frequency of your behavior. So cognitively oriented learning theory that emphasizes observational learning. It occurs when children observe behaviors of other people. The other people are the models. 
people, um, people after whom individuals pattern their own behavior. So this is what they're saying. So a lot of these theorists say, stick the child in the room, in the environment by themselves and let them figure it out. So there's studies on that too. And we'll talk about this. We'll go in a little more into depth on these examples too, but um, later on in the chapters. But if I stick the child in the room with this toy, they might crawl over or walk over and play with this toy. They don't know how to play with it. They just see a toy, they're gonna go to it and they're gonna start playing with it. But if they they see me playing with the toy, we, they come into the room with me and they see me playing with the toy and then I leave and put the toy down, that child is gonna play with the toy the way I played with the toy. Because I gave, I gave, I was the model that taught them how to, how to play with that toy. So this is what they're saying. They're saying that children learn based on their environment and the models that are provided to them teach them this. They they don't they they can learn things on their own, but we are they're they're surrounded by people and 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 um and environments that they're going to learn from no matter what. So the evaluation of these learning theories is the learning theory allows people to explain, predict and influence aspects of behavior. They have influenced teaching approaches used in educational TV shows. Think about that. Think about what the kids watch on TV on a regular basis. That's an influence. Everything around you is an influence. Social media is the, the doomsday of everybody, uh, especially the children, right? Um, because everybody's on it now. So a child's ability to mentally represent the world and solve problems are the result of interaction of experience and then the maturation of neurological structures. They have to be able to cognitively be able to understand what they're doing. Uh, you can't stick an infant into the room and, and have them model the behavior, right? Maybe a toddler could start modeling it, but the infant is not cognitively there yet. But they will, as they advance through the stages of their life, they can, they mature and they start learning based on the interactions that they have around them. Um, so advanced by P John Piaget, he talks about the concepts of scheme, which is the action pattern of mental structures involved in acquiring or organizing knowledge, right? So it's basically being able to acquire, so a person being able to acquire knowledge organize it in their mind and understand it and remember it, all these things. That's what scheme is. The adaption is the interaction between the organism and the environment. The organism could be the, the child, the person. They are the organism and then the environment that they're placed in. Um, assimilation is the incorporation of e new events or knowledge into existing schemes, right? So you are placed into a new event um, but you pair it with the information you know from some um, from old existing events or schemes that you've had in the past, and you decide how to respond in that new environment. That's assimilation. Accommodation is the modification of existing schemes to permit the incorporation of new events or knowledge, right? So I take that information from the old events that I know, my old knowledge, my old, what I have in my memory somewhere. And then I get put into this environment and I modify my behavior to fit into that environment based on what I know, right? So um, we are conditioned to, walk, like I said, we are conditioned to go into a certain environment and act in a certain way. Um, you modify your behavior based on those conditions. Um, just, it's like, it's like in a grocery store, you go to the grocery store and you have to line up to pay to get out, right? You got to get in the line. Now you go to a state fair and there's no space that says line, line here. Okay. But everybody knows because we, we, we've been, we, we've, we've used assimilation and commendation to teach us that we have to get into a line. We can't just walk in front of people. That's not the right thing to do. So you use that from your existing scheme, your existing knowledge, and people just start forming a line on their own. It doesn't matter where. They just pick a spot. Everybody just starts lining up behind each other. And that's that you just know that from your general knowledge. That's what um, that's the form of this assimilation accommodation. And then it says the equal equilibration is the creation of a balance between the two. 
It's basically you learning how to do things in new environments from the information that you have in from old environments and you figure out things. You figure out how to act and how to be in that environment on your own. Um, you have to be able to cognitively develop and know that, right? So it's like walking into classroom. You, you were taught in your younger grades when you were in elementary school to sit at walk into a classroom quietly and sit down. So now you're you go into college and it's not, it comes naturally to you because this is in your assimilation accommodate, uh, accommodation. You just know I I need to go into this the classroom quietly and not cause a scene. Um and that that's part of it's it's part of what we've already it's in there. It's your scheme. It's it's based on everything that you already learned in earlier parts of your life. So now we have some stages of cognitive development. It's this, we have the sensory motor stage, the pre-operational stage, the concrete operational stage, and then the formal operational stage. Um, Piaget may have underestimated the ages when children were capable of doing certain things. So Piaget, like I said, um, some people contradicted him a little bit because he was one of the very, very first theorists. And then other people came in and kind of said, let me fix this a little bit. Um, let me change some of the wording that you have. So he was a little bit underestimated by his the age groups that he chose. And, they, and later on, people came up with their own different age groups of how people develop. Many cognitive skills may develop gradually and not in distinct stages. Right. So and this is remember, every child is there. We said is their own blank state. Every child has different people around them, different environments, different stimuluses, different models to teach them. So ev not every child is going to learn at the same pace. They're not going to develop at the same pace. So what they're saying is that skills may develop gradually and not in distinct stages, right? So just because by age seven, you're supposed to know this doesn't mean that every child at age seven is gonna know this because some people need a little bit more time. Um, and it happens in stages, um, it gradually happens, but not in the exact set age group that's pinned, right? Just like think about a baby walking. If when we go into the charts later on, you'll see that what it says about babies walking. Some babies start work walking super early. They say by two years old or so. Um, but um, my 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 son started walking at seven months. So um, every child is different, even though the chart doesn't say that. Um, so yeah, they have what they form their distinct stages, but not everybody is in those stages. Some people develop faster, and some people a little bit slower. Theories provide an essential foundation for researchers con concerned with sequences in cognitive development. It's the, pro the process of encoding information, storing that information in your long-term memory, then being able to retrieve that information or place it into your short-term memory, memory, and then manipulating the information to help you solve problems, kind of like um, what we just talked about, the accommodation assimilation. You manipulate the information to solve the problems. It directly relates to physical development within, within the theories of evolutionary psychology and etiology. Etiology is the study of behaviors specific to a species that are inborn, such as mutations, genetic instruction, leading to variations among individuals due to sudden changes, right? So individuals are better adapted to environments that are more likely to survive, right? So what they're saying is that um, we're studying behavior and everybody, everybody has this inborn trait to kind of learn and develop. Um, but there are always going to be some like some kind of door in everyone's way or some kind of variation to change your course. Um, so those sudden changes are kind of like an obstacle course and people have to get past them. It's like a video game. Some people can figure it out really quickly and some people can play that video game hundred times before they beat it. That's etiology. That's it's it's the, the, the changes in the course that you have to just kind of learn to adapt to as they come. Evolutionary psychology, it deals with the ways in which humans' historical adaptions to the environment influence behavior and mental processes. 
Instinctive species, uh, species or specific behavior patterns help an organism to survive and reproduce. We are the organisms. When I re refer to organisms, I'm talking about us as humans, right? We have adaptive instincts. We have instincts, right? So um, think it, it's kind of like if someone like is, goes to hurt you, your instinct is to push them away. You get burned, you touch something that's hot, your instinct is to back away that we have natural instincts as an organism we have natural instincts so that we can survive um aggressive behavior and mating strategies also play uh, our natural instincts they're natural they come naturally we all have aggressive behavior we all have mating instincts it's called and we also call it the fixed action pattern it's a stereotype pattern of behavior evoked by releasing a stimulus we all have it in different forms and different scenarios, but it's a stereotype behavior or pattern that um, people predict someone is going to act, right? Um, it's like uh, someone biting you. Your, your, your reaction, your stereotype pattern is to pull away or push that person away that, um, to keep them off of you, your, your instincts to protect yourself. So I like to kind of talk about e ecology what they say is the branch of biology that deals with the relationships between living organisms and their environment so think of ecology as like a tree it's fall right now so you can see all the trees outside that have no leaves on them right but they have all these branches that ecology is like all the different branches and each leaf um or each branch is the different environments that you're placed in. You are the tree. And then the branches are the different environments that you're placed in. And then the leaves are the different people in those environments that you're around you. So um, all of those things play an influence on how you grow and you develop. If you have no branches and you have no leaves, how are you, you, you're not gonna develop that quickly. You have nothing teaching you any skills. But everybody has, most people have lots of different branches and different trees. And that plays a lot. And there's a system that and I'm going to show you that in the next slide. But um, the ecological system theory explains child development through reciprocal influences between children and environmental settings. So this is like, uh, this is my version of the tree. Okay, this is the, their version for the textbooks version, but you're the tree, the child is the tree, and the branches are all of the micro and meso systems around them, right? So um, you have family, school, peers, doctors and health services, religion, um, daycares, neighborhoods, playgrounds, uh, neighbors, those all are micro systems. Those small things in the me immediate things are the micro system. The meso system is the school board, the government, the social services, the media, um, the parents' economic situation with work. Those are the meso systems. Those are the outer parts, right? Um, and then the exo system is the extended family, your neighbors, your cousins, those people you don't see too often. The, micro, the macro system is the, the attitudes and ideologies of the culture, of those other people around you. They all have different methods of ideas, of ide culture, of teaching, of, of thinking. And then the chrono system is the environmental changes that occur over the life course, right? So the environmental changes for you and I um, when when I when I was younger, we we didn't have cell phones and computers and all these things. That they were just coming out, right? So that's the the chrono system is how it it changed. And now we have all this technology, and these children today have all this advanced technology that we didn't have. So um, that's the chrono system it, it develop of of the environment around you. So this is my version of saying the tree is the child and all the branches are all the environments and things around them. And the leaves are the people within those environments around them that are all influences on that child and how they're going to develop and learn and be what size tree they're going to be. Are they going to be a smaller tree or a bigger tree, right? Um, taking all that information in every child's 
um, microsystem is different, mesosystem is different, exosystem is different. Every child, all those systems are different. So every child is going to develop differently. All right. So social cultural perspective is developed by Vygotsky. He focuses on transmission of information and cognitive skills from generation to generation. He says that humans are social beings affected by their cultural environment. And he views the child's functioning as adaptive to social and cultural interactions. He also talks about the zone of proximal development and scaffolding. So the zone of proximal development, is, he says, is the range of tasks that a child can carry out with the, with the help of someone more skilled. It's the different, how many different tasks that they can actually do with someone's help on their own or with some, or someone helping them do all these different things, right? The range of how much they can actually do, where scaffolding is the temporary cognitive structure or method of, sol of solving problems that help the child function independently. So if you've never seen a scaffold, it's like a ladder that a painter uses to get on top to paint somewhere really high. The scaffold, you are the scaffold to that child. You are right there teaching them hands-on how to do things. So if you're teaching a child how to make breakfast or to learn how to make breakfast on their old, on their own, you're the scaffold. You're going to take, you're going to say, okay, take the bowl out of the cabinet. All right, take, you're, you're literally giving them, I, I call it like a recipe. You're giving them the recipe to do it. You are the, re you're teaching them this recipe. You are the recipe teaching them. So you're going to say, take the bowl out of the cabinet. Get a, get a mixing spoon. You're going to, let's say we're making pancakes. You're going to pour the, the pancake mix in. Maybe you're going to add some water or oil. You're going to, now you're going to take the egg and you're, maybe you're going to hold that child's hand and help them crack the egg and break it into the bowl. And then you're going to say, okay, let's mix it. And you're probably going to hold that child's hand and help them mix it. That's what the scaffold, you are the scaffold teaching them to do that. If you do this every day with them, eventually the child is going to get up on that stool themselves you don't need to say anything and they're going to open up the cabinet, take out the bowl, get the mixing spoon, get the mix, pour in the ingredients that they need. They're going to be able to crack that egg on their own and they're going to be able to mix it on their own. Eventually the scaffold gets taken away. They no longer need the scaffold. Scaffold needs to be taken away. It's, it's a temporary structure. It's temporary, but they need the scaffold in order to learn how to do that. And that's everything in life, right? So um, you think of yourselves as the scaffold or actual, the actual picture of a scaffold to be able to do something. Eventually, the goal is that the child will learn to function independently on their own without the scaffold. Um, so human diversity is the awareness of diversity helps understand individuals. Issues that affect various ethnic groups are bilingualism, ethnic differences in intelligence, um, intelligence test scores, prevalence of suicide, patterns of child rearing among parents and various groups, and some expectations of female and males are polarized both by cultural expectations. So here, and you know, just because we're here in America doesn't mean that everybody's culture's expectations are the same. There are still a lot of cultures that are here today or in other countries that still have a certain form of thinking and beliefs and follow that strictly, right? Um, so historically, females have been discouraged from careers in science, politics, and business. Today, women are making inroads into academic and vocational spheres. Most US college students are female, but in other countries, women are prohibited from getting an education, right? So think about what's going on right now today. All the people that are, are, are leaving and coming to our countries because they want that freedom. They want the same freedom that you and I have, right? Um, may, other people may have other reasonings, but most of the people that are coming here want this, right? This freedom. In other countries, this still happening today, females are not allowed to get an education. They're not allowed to work. They're not, they just basically slaves to their families. And this is why a lot of people leave. Um, everybody's cultural background is different. And just because it says um, females have been discouraged from careers in science and, and politics and stuff like that, it still is that way today. 
not much is changing. We we will see handful of women in in so in certain places, but we don't see a lot. Okay. And there's many reasons. One, it, it's a big fear for a woman to put themselves into an environment with the, with all men and have to go to work every day and deal with men every day. That, that's an all, all a man environment, right? So that's one thing, but there's many factors that play a role. And in, in a lot of careers, you can have the same job as a, as a male and women are still getting paid less. So we are making strides in, in new changes, but there's still a lot that need development. A lot of things still need changes. So um, this is what uh, a lot of things in human diversity that they're talking about is that females um, still today in certain areas and certain cultures are still aimed to get, and now you see more women in college and less men um, because women are discouraged from doing these more difficult jobs and other things. Women are pushed into certain fields um, and th they want what they say is that they want less of that. We want to see more women in politics, more women in science, more women taking the lead roles in things. So there are lots of controversies and development of age, uh, religion, everything else plays a form in everyone's life. So we also go into now what we kind of briefly mentioned it earlier, the nature, um, nature versus nurture. So the nature controversy is the process within an organism guiding it according to its genetic code. And nurture is the environmental factors that influence development. So nature is natural, right? It's the, like, think about the nature around you. That all comes naturally. Nurture is your environmental influences. It's the people and the environments around you that are influence your development. So throughout the different age groups, infancy and childhood and go, going on, everybody has both nature and nurture. Um, it's the natural causes of development, genetics, functioning of the nervous system and maturation. Um, and then the environmental causes are nutrition, cultural and fam family backgrounds and educational opportunities are all environmental causes that play a role. So continuity and discontinuity controversy, it's a continuous perspective. Development is a process where effects of learning increase steadily with no sudden qualitative changes. So the continuous perspective is that you, you, you drive down the same road and you see the same thing and there's nothing new happening, no changes. That doesn't really happen in life, right? Um, we, we're really more, we live in the discontinuous perspective where a number of rapid qualitative changes happen in your life that usher new stages of development. N typically, not everybody's gonna stay on that continuous perspective where there's absolutely no change, right? There's always going to be changes. It may happen in spurts throughout your life. It may take a long time before the next one happens, but most people undergo a numerous amount of dis uh, discontinuous perspectives. <clears throat> and the biological changes provide the potential for psychological changes. And Freud and Piaget were dis discontinuous theorists. <clears throat> Okay, so we also have active and um, and passive controversies. The active perspective is children are naturally engaged in their environment. And then the passive perspective is children are passive and the environment acts on them to influence development. So it's it's it says it in itself, right? Active children are naturally innate to do things and act in the environment that they're placed in, where passive, um, they act based on the influences around them and they do both. Everybody does both. Okay, so some techniques used to gather information. Now we're going into research and study a little bit. The naturalistic observation, the scientific method in which organisms are observed in their natural environments. We, a case study is basically you're studying people or one person at a time. A case study is a carefully drawn account of an individual's behavior. It uses questionnaires, standardized tests, interviews, observations, all kinds of things to study that case study is, could be the person or a child or whoever it is. 
Now we have the correlation method. Um, you don't really need to know the numbers too much, but it's an, it's the correlation efficient is the number ranging from positive one to negative one that expresses the direction and strength of the relationship between two variables. So we have positive and negative correlation, kind of similar to the, the positive and negative reinforcement, right? Um, it, it, it strengths uh, direction of different directions of the things. And then we have limitations. It does not show cause and effect. It's selection factors leads to misunderstanding of the results. So here's an example. And I kind of, this is what I was, the chart where I, I similar, said it was very similar to the other um, reinforcements. So a positive correlation, it says, as one variable increases, the other variable increases. So time spent studying increases your grades in school. The negative correlation is as one variable increases, the other variable decreases. So the frequency of delinquent acts, like not showing up to class, your grades in school will go down. So that's the positive and negative. It's very similar to the reinforcement, but these are the correlations. So your actions are your consequences, right? You have, you have consequences to your actions. So you study more, your grades go up positive positive correlation. You stop showing up to class, your grades are gonna go down. Um, so you have, a, it's the kind of the opposite, that's the negative. <clears throat> in experiments, you've done experiments at some point in your life in school, scientific investigation that questions cause and effect relationships. <clears throat> it introduces independent variables and observes their, effect, their effects on dependent variables. You may have, you test a hypothesis and then uh, proposition the, to be tested, right? So your hypothesis may not work, it may work, whatever it is, but it's a test, it's an experiment. The independent variable is a scientific condition that manipulated to, that is manipulated to observe its effects. And then the dependent variable is the measure of an assumed effect of an independent variable we have two types of control groups within that. So we have experimental group and then a control group, right? So the experimental group is the subject who receives the treatment. And then the control group is the subjects that do not receive the treatment. All other conditions are comparable to those of the experiment group. So what happens here is that um, all the, this is like, like cancer research in, in, as an example, right? So all these people come in and they all have the same illness and we want to do a study to see if this new medication that comes out works, but I can't give everybody the medication. So what would they do is they have an experimental group and a control group. The experimental group actually gets the actual medicine and the control group gets a placebo. It's just a sugar pill. Nobody knows which one they're getting. Um, and then they observe their behavior and, and, and see what happens. Because there's lots of belief that if you believe that you're getting better, you will get better, right? So um, they don't tell anybody who has the actual medicine. And some people do really well in these um, with the actual medicine and some people do really well with, in, with the placebo. So this is what these, whenever they do a, take a new pill comes out, or any kind of new medication or new test, they always do an experimental group and a control group. And this is how they determine whether this should come out into the world, right? But in those experimental group and control group, people have to volunteer. You can't, you need to know what that you're volunteering for this. So subjects should be assigned on a chance or at random basis. So you're not, you never, are allowed to just pick somebody from one um, ethnicity. It has to be mixed. It has to be mixed throughout everything, different age groups, different ethnicity, male, female, everything has to be mixed and it has to be at random. And you can't just stick to one particular type of person. And then we have um, different studies on that test with those groups. And we have longitudinal research it's the study of developmental processes, which are repeatedly measuring the same group of participants at various stages of development. So think of yourselves as um, the longitudinal research, okay? Um, 
throughout the whole entire course of your time in Jersey College, your grades are being documented into these computer systems, right? That's a longitudinal research. And they use that information from all of you to do further studies on new income or change things for new, new incoming students. So <clears throat> the typical time of a study spans across months or years. And that's what longitudinal is long, a long-term study on different group, different age groups of people, different various groups of different ages, different people over a course of a long period of time. Research researchers must enlist future researchers to continue the study. So if you opt in to be researched or to be studied for the next 10 years, that that researcher may not be around for the 10 years. So they have to enlist other people to take over their research in, in case something happens to them. So longitudinal is think of yourselves in, in school and the and all the grades that you have and everything. Someone's looking through those those statistics somewhere. Um, and then cross sectional research is the study of developmental processes. It measures participants of different age groups at the same time. Right. So it's not over a long period of time. It's in one time, one setting, different age groups. Um, um, and they're being taking the same measurement, but of different age groups in this setting right now. So cross-sectional is hap happens now in this section, this time, but it's across various age groups. And then the cohort effect is similarities in behavior among a group of peers that stem from the fact that group members were born at the same time in history and challenge to, uh, which is a challenge to cross-sectional research. So um, if I take um, the same research that I did with the lo longitudinal study, right? I'm watching these people over a long period of time as they develop with all the new things that come into their new environments. But cohort effect, I take a group of, of kindergarten, a group of five-year-olds, a group of 12-year-olds and a group of 15-year-olds they, the, the challenge here is that they were born in the same time history. That group of five-year-olds was in, were born in one same, so all their, their results are going to come up the same um, majority. All the seven-year-olds results are going to come up the same, the same as the seven-year-olds, but not as the five-year-olds, right? So that plays a challenge in this, and this is why they do more than one type of research for certain things. So combining both the longitudinal and the cross-sectional research is the key. It, moder it monitors individuals of different ages for abbreviated periods of time, but it breaks up the full span of the ideal longitudinal study in um, convenient segments. Um, it also minimizes the number of years needed to complete a study. And it uses what they call a time lag comparison, which is the study of developmental processes by taking measures of participants of the same age group at different times. And this is a chart that they gave you to kind of um, give you examples. You don't have to memorize any of these charts, um, but they're just to give you a better explanation, right? So, um, you know, they said like here is age four, age eight, age 12 over. So we have longitudinal, right? Age four and age eight over a course of a long period of time. And then um, the, the cross sectional is, is it goes up, right? So it's the different section, it's long periods of time. And then we have one age group at this time, age four is I'm just studying the people in age four and I'm just studying the people that are happening right now. Ethnical considerations. Researchers are not to use methods that may cause physical or psychological harm. Participants must be informed of the purposes of the research and its methods. Participants must provide voluntary consent to participate in the study. Um, participants may withdraw from the study at any time for any reason. Participants should be offered information about the results of the study. Identities of the participants are always to remain confidential and researchers should gain approval of their colleagues and the committees before proceeding, which means that I can't just go and say, I'm going to go do this study and not tell anybody, right? You have to get approval of a committee first. And this is the end of chapter one. I know it's a very long chapter. 
Um, does anybody have any questions? Okay, no questions. So um, like I said, this is a long, we have a long evening together. So I'm gonna give everybody like a, uh, a 10 minute break. If you need a, a, another minute or so, I'll give people time to come back. Um, so take this time for yourself. Think about it. we're at the 7.32, come at like 7.45 and come back. And then um, we'll we'll start again and we'll finish chapter two. Right. Thank you. Thank You're you. Welcome. Yes. Yes. Thank right. you. So we'll see. I'll see you guys at seven forty-five. Okay. Thanks. All right.
All right. I hope everyone had a nice little break. I know it was a lot, a lot of information to take in. Um, and every Monday night's like this. Uh, so, you know, if you guys do feel that you need a little bit longer breaks or anything, please let me know. I'm happy to do that. Um, you know, my, my goal is to try to get you out of here sooner, um, so that you don't have to stay the whole night. Um, but if you guys need the breaks, we'll do, we can work on that too. If you need more than one, we can figure that out. Okay. So now we're going into chapter two and it's what we talk about heredity and prenatal development in chapter two. So the learning outcomes are to describe the influences of heredity on development, describe the influences of the environment on development, explains what happens in the process of conception and recount the major events of prenatal development. So the influence of heredity on development. We have, um, this is all genetics, right? And all, all, all inside our bodies. So there's a lot of terms that we all have to learn and know too. So chromosomes, we have genetics. Um, it's the field of biology that studies heredity Genetic influences are fundamental in the transmission of uh, physical traits. Chromosomes are rod-shaped structures composed of genes that are found within the nuclei of cells. Human cells contain 46 chromosomes organized into 23 pairs. A gene is the, bio, um, the biochemical material that regulates the development of traits. So these traits are, are such as like blood type. It's transmitted by a single pair of genes, um, one of which is derived from each parent. And then we have what we call polygenic. It's the result from several pairs of genes from each parent, right? So um, the deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA, is the genetic material that takes the form of a double helix and it's composed of phosphates, sugars, and bases. So that your DNA is your biological makeup. And we have a, a little picture here is the double helix of the DNA, the cell, the nucleus, the chromosomes, right? That are made up of the DNA. And then we have the DNA, the segments that are made up of the genes. So then we have what we call mitosis. It's the form of cell division in which each chromosome splits lengthwise to double in number, right? So think about those chromosomes and they split and they double in number. So half of each chromosome combines with chemicals to retake its original form and then moves to a new cell. We call we call that a pro like mutation. It's a sudden variation in a uh, her heritable characteristic as by an accident that affects the composition of genes. So sometimes these genes may mutate and form differently. And it, it, they, it, they call it like an, a, an accident, a composition of genes that wasn't supposed to happen. Mitosis, right? So we have, um, this is what, what mitosis is. And then we have, it's made up of adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. And it's it's a forming of them. And then you see that they kind of break apart, right? And they, they kind of come separate. So meiosis or the reduction of division is the form of cell dividing, the cell division, in which each pair of chromosomes split so that one cell of each pair moves to the new, to a new cell. And in the, the results is that each new cell has 23 chromosomes. And then the autosome is the member of pairs of those chromosomes. Um, sex chromosomes has the shape of a Y, which is for male, and X for female, and it determines the sex of the child. So you can see that and you'll see um, in there, in the chromosomes, we have the X and they, they'll, they'll have various shapes. And you just, we'll go into the textbook and later in the slides, you'll see the different forms of them, but you can, up oh, here it is. And you can see the different, how they look, but 
the 23 pairs of human chromosomes, and then you look at the female and then the male. And this is how they kind of look, and they vary and they change different forms, but they kind of go in there in the same form. You can tell the difference. So monozygotic twins, right? So we have identical and fraternal twins. M monozygotic twins is where the zygote divides into two cells that separate and each develop into an individual with the same genetic makeup. Where zygotic twins are two ovaries that are produced in the same month and each is fertilized by a different sperm. So as women reach the end of childbearing years, ovulation um, typically tends to become less regular and chances of twins actually increase with um, prenatal age or parental age. So um, then we have the different types of traits, right? So dominant and recessive traits, and that goes with twins as well, right? You have to have, have be a, a carrier to have twins. It, it's a trait that you would carry. So traits are determined by a pair of genes, which are the alleles, and each member of a pair of gene and then we have homozygous, which is the identical allele for a trait in a person. And the heterozygous is different alleles for a trait in a person. Incomplete dominance or, uh, or co-dominance occurs when effects of both alleles are shown. Traits are determined by the dominant allele and appears in the offspring. So the, when the child is born, you see the traits and then you, that's how you, you know for sure which parent has the dominant gene in that trait. So dominant traits is expressed and the recessive trait is not expressed when genes have been paired with dominant genes. So the, they could still carry it, um, but they're not expressed. So which is the carrier is the person who carries and transmits characteristics, but does not exhibit them. So you can have two children an example could be that um, the dominant trait is two children are born. Um, and I, a great example I can give you guys is that I, my two sons, um, one has brown hair and one has blonde hair. Both, um, me and my husband both have dark hair, dark features. None of us have blonde, right? But one of my second son was born with blonde hair. So one of us carries that dominant trait. We're carriers of that trait. And now my, my son with the blonde hair got, he expressed the dominant trait. My other son with the brown hair is now a carrier and he's carrying that trait. And maybe one of his children could have blonde hair. So it goes down long generations of genes. Um, so um, we, we would probably have to look at our family timeline to determine which one of us ha has that dominant trait because we both have dark features and dark hair. And so, and nobody in our families, which means that we've been carriers of this, right? So um, my fit, nobody in my family has blonde hair. Nobody in his family has blonde hair. So somewhere down our line of genes where everybody's carriers carrying this trait. Um. Okay, and then here's another example. And this, so, and when we talk about these dominant and recessive traits, this doesn't, I'm not just referring to hair. This refers to eyes, skin color, pigments, your, your nails, every part of your body. Everything has their own traits and their own dominant and recessive traits. So this is just an example, um, a brown eyed parent, right? Oh, and so that's, an, that's another thing, right? So, um, a great another example for you guys to have is we have brown uh, both brown eye parents and the the b is the is the dominant tree the capital b is the dominant and the lower b is is not right so um children can be born with both and become brown eyed but the blue eye or it's, it's vice versa the lower b is the uh, the dominant i'm sorry but the 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 two lower b is the baby on the right has the blue is the blue eyed child he is the one who got the tra both traits of the the dominant trait so it can all children can be born with them or one out of all the children it doesn't matter it can, it, it depends on the genes that are, that you carry and who who gets it um, so it's it's not really determined until once the baby starts forming.
That's another thing, right? So um, my son with the blonde hair was born with blue eyes. And neither of us um, have blue eyes. I have brown eyes and my husband has green eyes. But none of our kids and my my one son with the brown hair, he has all the traits of me. He's my twin. He's my little, little mini me makeup, the brown hair child. Um, every trait that he has, every single trait of mine. But the blonde haired one, he's got all these traits that we carried, those dominant traits that we were carrying from our family line. Okay, so chromosomal and genetic abnormalities. Chromosomal disorders reflect abnormalities in 20 two pairs of autosomes or in sex chromosomes. So um, when there's an abnormality in the chromosome, the sex becomes kind of impaired. And this is where um, the determination of sex um, plays a role and where people kind of say, oh, well, I don't know. I feel like I'm, um, this, is what, this is what happens. Something happens in these chromosomal, these genes that change and form this abnormality and that single pair of gene or a combination of ge different genes either cause traits that problems for that child when they're born or, or the makeup of the sex can be manipulated in some way. And this is where we have some people who um, aren't sure or feel like they belong with a different sex, right? Because something happened in those, in the chrome, in their chromosomal change. So multifactorial problems, many, many different multi different problems can happen that stem from the interaction of heredity and environment. So heredity is the genes that you carry, what you inherit. And then we also have environmental influences um, or environmental factors that play a key role. And what those are is the food we eat, the chemicals that we consume, the air we breathe and 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 the list can go on and on and on right so we have her what we inherit we inherit the heredity and then there's also many environmental factors that change everything and yeah there there's a lot of a lot of belief and studies that are talking about how these chromosomal disorders are a, more about environmental than heredity so it's characterized by intellectual disabilities and it's caused by an extra chromosome in the 21st pair, which results in 47 chromosomes. Oh, so this, I'm sorry, I didn't say that the title here is Down syndrome. So Down syndrome specifically has that extra chromosome, right? So in the, so it results in, so the extra chromosome in the 21st pair results in 47 of them, right? Because they're split. So features of a person or a child born with Down syndrome can be a rounded face, a protruding nose, a broad flat nose, and then sloping fold of skin over the inner covers um, of the eyes. And in the textbook, there's a picture, there's an image for you guys. So some sex-linked chromosomal abnormalities. Um, one male in 700, from 700 to 1,000 has that extra Y chromosome. And because they have that, they have heightened male secondary characteristics, sex characteristics, and may even develop language um, delay in developmental language. One male in 500 has what we call Kleinefelter syndrome. It's caused by that extra X sex chromosome, and it gives it causes them to have less testosterone levels than normal males. And it leads to inadequate development of male primary and secondary sex characteristics, which means that um, that they are linked to um, not being able to have children. Most cannot. And then the same thing. So one female in 2,500 has a single X sex chromosome resulting in what we call Turner syndrome. It's poorly developed ovaries, short and infertile. One female in a thousand has that triple X sex chromosomal structure called triple X syndrome. And it's normal in appearance, but tends to show lower than average language skills and poorer memory for recent events. So um, Kleinefelter, you wanna know is ma the male, right? And they're both linked to 
infertility, both of them. So this is the male version, Klinefelter syndrome, and then the fe female version is Turner syndrome. And they both have this extra X, this extra chromosome, and it's linked to, basically linked to infertility. So some genetic abnormalities um, are what we call phenacinora PKU. The phenylene builds up and causes intellectual disabilities. And then Huntington's disease is a fatal genetic neurological disorder whose onset is in the middle ages. Sickle cell anemia, it decreases the blood's capacity to carry oxygen. Tay-Sachs disease is a fatal neurological disorder that causes the degeneration of nervous systems. Cystic fibrosis is a fatal disorder in which mucus obstructs the lungs and pancreas. Some genetic defects carried only on the X sex chromosome involve recessive genes. Females with two X sex chromosomes are less likely than males to show sex linked disorders. And sons of female carriers are more likely to be afflicted. Um, Dutchian is a form of muscular dystrophy that is um, also linked, sex linked. Muscular dystrophy is the chronic disease, which is characterized by a progressive wasting away of the muscles. And other sex link abnormalities are, are such as diabetes, color blindness, and some types of night blindness. So there's a lot of um, diseases and illnesses in here in this text that I suggest knowing them all. They may only ask you one or two questions on them, but you, you never know which ones they're going to be, right? So at least having a, an idea of them. And this is why when we when I put in that your term paper topics to choose somewhere around here, because if you write a research paper, you have to write a paper, right? So if you're going to write a paper, why not choose something that you already have to study? to help yourself. So you are more than welcome to veer off if you need to and you want to tell, let me know, but save yourself the time and help yourself get familiar with some of these some of these diseases and choose something that is worth knowing about that you that you can that can help you benefit on the exam. So we have what we call genetic counselors and prenatal testing genetic counseling. Um, it's it's compile of information about a couple's genetic heritage to explore if their children will have a genetic abnormality. Couples with the likelihood of passing on a genetic abnormality tend to adopt or have children of their own or, or, um, or do not have children of their own. And then prenatal testing indicates whether an embryo or fetus is carrying a genetic abnormality. So they first do those prenatal testings and then if they see that something could be, or they ask questions and they take notes, the doctors take notes, and this is why we have prenatal exams. Um, and then they'll recommend genetic counseling. So they take information from you and your, and your partner, and they say, they determine whether they think that you should look into this genetic counseling. And um, then they'll go over the test and then decide whether you need to do, do further testing. So some prenatal testing procedures are the amniocentesis, ultrasound, chronic villus sampling, CVS, and then blood tests. The chronic villus sampling is the samples, the membrane in, um, envelop enveloping the amniotic sac and fetus. A syringe is inserted through the vagina into the uterus to suck out the red light projections of villi from the outer membrane. And it's carried out between the ninth and 12th week of pregnancy. It poses a, a very great risk um, than amniocentesis for miscarriage, right? So when we look at these different types, blood tests and ultrasounds are, you know, safe. They're your safe bet. You want to avoid doing those unless you really, really have to do amniocentesis or chronic villous sampling. An ultrasound is the sound waves too, um, waves too high in pitch to be heard by human ears. It's used to obtain information about the fetus. And a sonogram is the procedure for using ultrasonic sound waves to create a picture of an embryo or fetus. It guides 
Um, it, it's also used in the amniocentesis and CVC to guide the syringe by determining the position of the fetus, right? So it tracks the growth of the fetus and detects multiple pregnancies and structural abnormalities. Again, um, ultrasounds are, are, are your safe bet, but you, it, unless it's very, very necessary, you want to avoid doing the amniocentesis and the CVC. Blood tests. They, I also can identify genetic disorders. The alpha fatal protein, AFP, um, detects neural tube defects and chromosomal abnormalities. Neural, neural tube defects elevate the AFP levels in the mother's blood, and it increases the risk of fetal, uh, fetal death. It's used to identify chromosomal abnormalities and the sex of the baby. All right, so heredity and environment. Now we have what we call genotypes and phenotypes. It sets, it's a set of traits humans inherit from their parents, the genotypes, and phenotypes are the actual sets of traits reflecting both genetic and environmental influences. So like I said, um, when we talk about all the problems that people are being, babies are being born with, right? All these things, they're getting these genotypes and phenotypes. They're born with them. And the genotypes are just the, in, the traits that are inherited from the parents, but the phenotypes are both. It's in, including the environmental influences, which is the air that the, that parent is breathing, the food that they're eating, and all the other things that they're doing environmentally that can affect that baby. Some kinship um, studies and twin studies and adoption studies. So there's little chapters in the textbook on in this, in, um, there's little paragraphs in this chapter on kinship studies, twin studies. There's small paragraphs, um, just making sure you read through them. Um, but there's not a lot of talk of these. So kinship studies are studies of traits or behaviors among relatives who vary in degree of genetic closeness. And twin studies, we talked about the monozygotic twins and diazygotic twins. The monozygotic twins share 100% of their genes, where the dizygotic twins only share 50% of their genes, and this, which is the same as other siblings. And then adoption studies help in identifying issues related to nature and nurture, right? So um, we talked about nature and nurture. Nature um, is natural. And nurture is the environmental factors, right? We we nurture our children. So um, when they do adoption studies, they're 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 studying children who were, you know, placed in different homes when their environments changed versus children who are born into one household and stay there. Lots of different studies can can show different changes in nature and nurture. All right, so now we have conception against all odds. Conception is the union of an ovum and a sperm cell, which is the ova released from the ovarian follicle and enters the fallopian tube. In case the egg is not fertilized, it is discharged through the uterus and vagina along with the endometrium, which is the inner lining of the uterus. Sperm cells develop through stages. Right, lots of things we talk. Even, even our, and even the cells have stages, have their own stages. So sperms with the Y sex chromosome, they say, swim faster than sperms with the X sex chromosome. So male fetuses te um, also tend to suffer a higher rate of miscarriages than females during the first month of pregnancy. Only one in a thousand sperms ejaculated can actually fertilize an ovum. Sperms have to fight vaginal acidity, gravity, and swim against the current of fluid coming from the cervix. If a sperm does survive, it reaches the fallopian tube um, 60 to 90 minutes after ejaculation, and only one sperm enters the egg. Once entered, the outer layer thickens and locks out other sperms. And then here's like an, an example. You have the conception, the ovum, the ovary, fallopian tube, uterus, cervix, vagina, and then there's your sperm entering. So um, while you don't have to memorize charts and stuff, and I don't think that they will give you charts on this to like 
you know, remember how to fill in, you do want to have an understanding of the, of the process, right? You want to make sure you know these things. And some people, it comes naturally that they, they understand this and know this, but we really want to know how, it, how the terms and how it works. Um, so this is just a kind of an example. Um, it says human uh, sperm swarming around the, an ovum in the fallopian tube. So fertility problems in men versus women. In men, low, they have low sperm count or lack of sperm. And some of the causes of this fertility problems are genetic factors, environmental poisons, diabetes and obesity, sexually transmitted infections, overheating of the testes, pressure, aging, and even certain drugs. In women, irregular or lack of ovulation due to irregularities among the hormones, stress and malnutrition, and fertility drugs. We all, they also have pelvic inflammatory disease, PID, and endometriosis. So today, and we'll kind of we'll get into it later on, but women, um, more and more women are struggling with um ovulation issues, being able to ovulate and infertility and all these things, um, uh, or, or irregular cycles. And the, even though this list is so much smaller than men, more women seem to struggle than men in some cases. So alternative ways of becoming parents. We have artificial insemination. It's the injection of a sperm in the uterus to fertilize an ovum. In vitro fertilization, it's fertilization of an ovum in a laboratory dish. Surrogate mothers, mothers who bring babies to term for other women who are infantile, uh, infertile. And then adoption, a way for people to obtain children that result in the formation of loving new families, right? So um, there's different ways, different reasonings why people um, might go this route. So if someone's a carrier, they may not go for the first three because they don't, they know they're, they're still giving something. Right. Um, and they don't want their, 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 their carrier to go into the baby. So they might just stick with adoption. So there's different reasons for different ways of becoming parents. Sex selection, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, PGD. It's developed to detect genetic disorders. It reveals the sex of an embryo. Overs are fertilized in vitro. Embryos of the desired sex are implanted in the woman's uterus and not always successful. So people can actually um, decide what sex, what, what they want. If they want a girl, they're going to have a girl. If, they, if, if they're going one of these routes, um, they can be, they can make a girl um, if they want. Prenatal development. So it's the normal gestation period, 280 days. It's divided into three periods, the germinal stage, the embryonic stage, and the fetal stage. So the germinal stage is the first two weeks. The embryonic stage is the third through the eighth week. And then the fetal stage is the third month through birth. In the germinal stage, it's the period from conception to implantation. Blastocysts are fluid-filled ball of cells formed by the dividing cell mass. Cells separate into groups that will eventually become different structures. The embryonic disc is two distinct layers in the inner part of the blastocyst, and it forms a thickened mass of cells that eventually uh, become the fetus. The tropoblast is the outer part of the blastocyte from which the amniotic sac um, placenta and umbilical cord all develop. And it gains mass only when it receives nourishment from the outside. It's growing. It's giving the, uh, the mom is eating and, and drinking properly. In the embryonic stage, it begins with implantation and then covers the fir uh, first two months. The development follows cephaclodal and proximodistal trends, um, which cephaclodal is the measure, basically the baby's measurement from head to foot. And then proximodistal is from the inner part to the axis of the body. It's, it's the, the span, how much the body is. Um, and then growth of the head proceeds 
the growth of the lower body parts. So their head grows a lot faster than their body parts. Um, at all, all the children are born. and their, your body, your head um, will set and be it's whatever it's going to be before you, while your arms and your legs are still trying to grow over a longer period of time. And during these embryonic stages, we have ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm. The ectoderm is the outer layer of the embryo, which develops into nervous system, sensory organs, nails, hair, teeth, and outer layer of the skin. The endoderm is the inner layer of the embryo, which forms the digestive and respiratory systems, the liver and the pancreas. And then mesoderms are central layer of the embryo. It develops into the excretory, reproductive, and circular systems, the muscles and the skeleton and the inner layer of skin. Major organ systems develop during the first two months. During the second month, the nervous system begins to send messages. And then by the end of that second month, the embryo takes um, <clears throat> a human form. And then teeth buds form by the end of this stage. <clears throat> and then we have sexual differentiation. By five to six weeks, internal and external genitals resemble female structures. By the seventh week, genetic code causes sex organs to differentiate. <clears throat> and then genetic activity on Y sex chromosome causes the testes to begin to differentiate. And ovaries begin to differentiate if the Y chromosome is absent. So not only um, is the sex pretty much determined by this time, but that embryo, that baby starts to they, they they start they're starting to learn and even though they're in in the womb they're still understanding that they 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 are one or the other in their own way and then androgens are produced once the testes develop the embryo and the fetus develop within a protective amniotic sac inside the uterus the sac is surrounded by clear membrane and contains amniotic fluid that fluid in the amniotic sac it, um, that suspends and protects the fetus. It keeps the fetus safe. <clears throat> okay, and then the placenta is an organ formed in the lining of the uterus that provides nourishment for the fetus and elimination of its waste products. So the baby, the, the fetus has to eliminate waste as well still. The mother and the embryo have separate circulatory systems um, and it secretes hormones that preserve the pre pregnancy, prepare the breast for nursing and stimulate the uterine contractions that prompt childbirth. The fetal stage lasts from the beginning of the ninth week of pregnancy through birth. The first trimester is where the major, major organs are formed. And then the second trimester consists of further maturation and gain in size, right? So that further um, formation is all the developmental parts of the body. The fetus advances from one ounce to two pounds and grows from about three to 14 inches. And the fetus can open and shut eyes and suck them by the end of the second trimester while in the womb. In the third trimester, the fetus gains about five and a half pounds and doubles in length. By the seventh month, the fetus turns upside down from the delivery to, to be head first, and it doubles in weight by the end of the seventh month. And 90%, by that time, by the end of that seven month, it's an, it becomes a 90% survival chance if born at the end of the seventh month and given quality care. So not just being born at the end of that, they still have to be taking, they have, still have to be nourished and care, quality care. The mom still should be eating proper nutrients and doing what she's supposed to do on her end. So fetal perception and movements. By the 13th week, the fetus responds to sound waves. The experiment by D. Casper and Pfeiffer in 1980 just demonstrated that fetuses learn while they're in the uterus. Right. So you can talk to the baby and the baby might start kicking or responding. That's what they're saying. So they start they did this study by 29 to 30 weeks. 
Fetuses move limbs vigorously and turns and do, and do somersaults. The fetus get, starts to get cramped as it grows and becomes less active during the ninth month. Some environmental influences, right? Environmental influences on prenatal development and nutrition. So that means the, these influences are stemming from what the mother is exposing herself to. Um, low birth weight. Pre these are all things that happen. Um, maternal malnutrition effects. Low birth weight, prematurity, retardation of the brain development, cognitive deficiencies, behavioral problems, cardiovascular disease. And then supplementing the diets of pregnant women to avoid deficiency of nutrients helps in the motor development of infants. So um, doctors will start to tell you right away, if you're pregnant, you should be drinking lots and lots of water. Enough water to give yourself water and then your baby water. Many, A lot of women don't do that. Um, and that, that, that can be, um, an environmental influence because they're not consuming exactly what they need. Um, if they're breathing in air from, from other people that are smoking or any other things, anything that's happening, um, if they're living in, um, a building that's not, you know, or, or they work in a building that's not clean properly or has, has poor ventilation, they're breathing that in. Those are environmental factors that can cause problems. Um, the food that we eat, and this is another thing, this is a whole nother thing in itself, but um, most people don't know that um, the food, if you go into the grocery store here in America, and then you go into a grocery store in another country, um, all the food here in our grocery store, majority of it, like like 85% of it is actually illegal in other countries because there's so many chemicals, bad chemicals in our food. And then we're eating that. And that's all part of environmental fluences that are going to those to these babies that are being born. Um, and so there's lots and lots of things that play roles in this. Um, and those longitudinal and cross-sectional research would need to be really need to be done um, to really know for sure. Um, environmental agents that harm the embryo or fetus. Okay, so now we're talking about drugs, right? Drugs that are taken by the mother, even heavy metals, pathogens, exposure to radiation. Exposure is the most harmful during critical periods. Right. That critical period is the period during which the embryo is particularly vulnerable to certain pathogens. It's the beginning stages of development. If the mom is exposed to that in the very, very beginning. The textbook talks about all the different types of drugs um, that someone can take um, that can cause problems. So here's some this is our critical period. This is the same thing in the textbook. Um, and it, the, this is, you know, you don't have to memorize this chart, but you do want to understand, you know, how the fetus is, the embryo is growing. You, you see, if you look at this chart, you can see when the eyes start to develop, the heart, um, the ears, the brain. And then if you look at the below, um, the red and the yellow or orange, just whatever colors there are, the red, um, major abnormal abnormality may occur, occur during this time. And then minor defects where abnormality may occur during those certain times, right? So these are things, these are all, this is the critical period, right? This is a very, very critical period for that baby and every environmental influence and every, and then accounting all the things that the mother carries and traits all play a role in this development of every child. So then we have also sexually transmitted infections, other influences, right? Other things that play. So syphilis can cause miscarriages, stillbirth, or congenital syphilis. HIV and AIDS during childbirth, blood vessels um, in the mother and baby rupture, enabling an exchange of blood and transmission of HIV. Rubella is a viral infection that can cause retardation and heart disease in the embryo, right? So um, a lot of these things, when the mothers, um, they, they, these all, all, all these things, they test typically when the mom is pregnant and especially when it's getting closer. Again, they do, may, may do this test a second time to make sure that the mom doesn't have these things for when the baby is being born so that they can try and help treat it. Preeclampsia 
or toxemia. They, they both mean the same thing. It's a life-threatening disease that causes high blood pressure, afflicting women late in the secondary or early in the third trimester. So pre preeclampsia is basically um, it, it's it, high blood pressure that it happens. It could happen out of nowhere. Um, and your your legs and your arms, everything starts to swell up and it can be become toxic. Think about toxemia, toxic. It can be toxic to the mother and can harm or even kill both mom and baby. Um, some people, it can happen. They can, this can happen like right in, in the middle of the pregnancy and then they suffer from it throughout the course and, and the doctor will put them on bed rest and, and stuff like that and monitor them. Or it can happen, it could start to happen right as they're about to give birth. So everybody's different. And then RH incompatibility. It's the antibodies produced by the mother are transmitted to a fetus or newborn infant causing brain damage or death. So most they want to know your blood type. This is all based on your blood type. Okay. So they really ask your blood type. And even if you know, they probably still uh, test you for it. And what they do is um, they give you a little card now. Um, every Most hospitals are different, but they'll give you a card to say that you're RH and um, incompatible or whatever. Um, but this is because the mom, if, if you, just as you, if you went to go get blood from a hospital and they gave you the wrong type of blood, your body is going to try and fight off that bad blood because it's, it's, it's like an infection, right? So the same thing is happening that the mother's body, the antibodies are produced to transmit to the fetus and fight off. So if the baby doesn't, has a different blood type than the mom, the, the this is what happens. So, um, this is these these tests are both done in in prenatal. You know this is why they want moms to get tested and go into the doctors monthly and then so on. So some drugs that I said mentioned in the textbook taken by parents we have thalidomide. It's a sedative used for treatment of insomnia and nausea. It can cause missing or stunted limbs during second month of pregnancy. So this is another thing that parents have to, um, or moms or pregnant people have to pay mind to that if you are on tons of medication and then you become pregnant, um, you have to seek a doctor right away because um, there are many risks, risks involved to the baby, but also risks involved that they have to take you off of that medicine. So there's a lot of things that have to be monitored. So um, hormones, are prescribed are usually prescribed for women at risk for mis miscarriages. So they sometimes they prescribe a hormone for women who are at risk for miscarriages, which is progestin. It's a synthetic hormone used to maintain pregnancy, but the side effect of it is that it can cause masculinization of the fetus. So other things, right? So we we give medicine, but everything has its own side effect. Um, DES, uh, dialytis, I always say this wrong, betastrol, is a powerful estrogen prescribed to prevent miscarriage, and it causes cervical, vi vaginal, and testicular cancers in some offsprings. So another thing, an, an estrogen, a medicine that can be given to the parent can be, it can cause these things. So really, and my thing is, why take it, right? Um, would you just, there's risks everywhere. High dosages of vitamin A and D are associated with central nervous system damage, small head size and heart defects, right? So um, typically they tell you to start taking prenatal vitamins. Prenatal vitamins have very small dosages of all these vitamins, very small dosages. It's to make sure that you're at least getting something. But people who have high dosages of these things have to be careful. And this is why we do blood tests to monitor everything to make sure that you're not, you're not taking prenatal vitamins on top of this, right? Uh, having high levels of these vitamins. Heroin and methadone. Maternal addiction leads to low birth weight, prematurity, and toxemia. Addicted newborns are given the neurotic or substitute shortly after birth to avoid withdrawal symptoms. Um, marijuana, it contributes to slower fetal growth and low birth weight. 
and babies of users show increased tremors and startling and impaired cognitive skills. Cocaine um, is used during pregnancy, increases risks of stillbirth, low birth weight and birth defects. Infants are, ex um, are excitable and irritable or lethargic with disturbed sleep. Then we have fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, FASD. It's a cluster of symptoms shown by children of women who drank heavily during pregnancy. So um, something to note here that I like to, you know, so they say this is shown by people who have um, women who drank heavily. And some women are like, oh, well, well, one drink is okay every now and then, right? Well, I've actually had many people in, in my courses that tell me that they know people or, or someone they know had just one or two drinks every now and then, and their baby was born with um, FASD. It was random, but they did it during that critical period. And just by not, they weren't drinking heavily and they, their baby was born like this. So um, to risk it, you know, chances are, you know, they, they, they warn you not to do it, but people do it. And to risk these things, same goes with caffeine, right? Um, they, they can cause all these birth problems. Caffeine can lead to miscarriage or low birth weight in babies. Um, and that's another thing. They say, okay, reduce your intake. Everybody drinks coffee. You can have a cup of coffee, right? But if you really look at the labels of everything, everything that we have has caffeine in it, everything. Um, and that's, that's important, you know, so you want to make sure you're reducing your levels of these things. And then it says, um, what happens to a fetuses who are on marijuana in the uterus? Mothers are more likely to have anemia, which is a deficiency in red blood cell count, lower birth weight, and more likely to need neonatal intensive care. School aged children have less impulse control and lower attention span in school, less learning happens as a result and tendency to behave more aggressively and engage in delinquent behaviors. So these are things that, you know, now that we're starting to legalize marijuana, marijuana in a lot of places, these things need to be put out there, right? They need to be taught to people because now you're allowing everybody to do this and it's legal, even though people did it and have done it over the years, they still should know the side effects of what happens if they get pregnant. Cigarettes consist of nicotine, carbon monoxide, and hydrocarbons, which is TARS. It's connected with impaired motor development, academic delays, learning and intellectual disabilities, and hyperactivity. Smokers' babies are more likely to be than those of non-smokers, smaller in size, and stillborn or die soon after birth. Other environmental hazards consist of heavy metals such as lead, mercury, and zinc. Prenatal exposure to lead um, to delayed mental development and one and two year olds of age. Fetal exposure to radiation in high dosages can damage the eyes, the central nervous system, and the skeleton. Pregnant women um, exposed to atomic radiation give birth to intellectually and physically deformed babies. And then parents age. Older fathers are more like, likely to produce abnormal sperm. 20s is the ideal age for women to bear children. So that we have like what we call a peak. The 20s is the peak. 20s. So women's fertility typically starts to decline gradually after the 20s until the mid 30s and more rapidly after the 30s. Women who wait until their 30s or 40s to have children increase the likelihood of having miscarriages. And many people are starting to wait till those times. Um, and then there's a lot of factors that play in if you're in your, you know, that the, you're increasing the likelihood if you wait, um, but then you also have this small window. So if you haven't had children and you're in your thirties already, then you have to make decisions quick. Right. Um, so that's it. These are all of our terms here. A lot of information. Anybody have any questions on this chapter? 
Okay. So what I wanted to do with you guys, we're not doing, obviously we're not doing our quiz this week. I wanted to go in. Um, I knew it was going to make me sign out because I left it on for too long. It does sign you out the send gauge, but I wanted to do a practice, do some of these practice quiz because I want you guys to get used to doing it and learning it um, and playing around with it and doing it for yourselves. I might have to exit out of it and then go back. So if I leave the screen open for too long, you guys, could, I want you guys to get the flow of seeing what happens, but it lo you, it's already saved so it can, you can log back in easily. Um, so let's see. Um, what I want you guys to do is answer these questions with me. See what we get, okay? And we'll check. So call out an answer if you think you know it. The discipline that studies the physical, cognitive, social, and emotional growth of humans is called what psychology developmental all right so um we can do it two ways we can either check our work or we can go on to the next question so you can on do the next on to the next okay so let's do it that way and here's a little tip for you guys too um this is what i'm saying this is for you guys to notice so assignment score went up to five percent which means even though it didn't check my work i know that we got the answer right Right. So you kind of see the score going up. If the score changes when you go on to the next, you could also know that you got it wrong and you can go back later. According to John Locke, a child comes into this world as an blank, blank, blank tablet. tablet. Blank tablet. All right. Blank tablet. Tablet. Sarah has recently become a mother. She believes that she can shape the behavior of her child by focusing on the environment in which her child is raised. Sarah's ideas agree best with those of the philosopher. John Locke. John Locke. All right, let's go on. Which of the following was a belief held by John Locke? B, 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 okay. B. So which of the following is a difference between John Locke and John Jacuz Rasur's writing? C. Mm -hmm. All right, you guys are doing great. The unfolding of genetically determined traits, structures, and functions is called... Mm -hmm. The unfolding. C. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Someone said C. I'm going with it. <laughs> yeah. And I know it was a good answer. Good job. Which of the following is true of the psychoanalytic perspective of development? Mm -hmm. um, B? I think, it's, I think, I think it's, it's B. All right. I hear B. That's all right. We'll go back to it after, even if we're not right. So let's see. <laughs> all right. Which of the following is a similarity between the psychosexual theory of development and the psychosocial theory of development? B. B. Mm -hmm. B. Which of the following? Mommy? What is it? Which of the following is a limitation of Sigmund Sigmund Freud's psychosexual theory? B. Mm -hmm. All right, you guys are doing great. Classical conditioning is a type of learning that. D. Scared. Hey. Scared a little bit. All right, so I hear DNA. I think it's 
Okay. Someone says B now. I hear a lot of different ones. A. All right. <laughs> all right. Well, that's all right. We'll go back. Don't worry. We'll see. A six month old Colin loves to put everything in his mouth while playing. He grabs his sister's dolls and tries to put its head in his mouth to suck on it. Um, he notices right away that the doll's hair tastes bad. So he pulls it out and waves it around instead. In this, in the context of Piaget's cognitive development theory, Colin is displaying. Accommodation. Yeah. Accommodation. Processing speed is a key component of blank intelligence. Fluid. 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 Very good. Fluid. Fluid mm -hmm. intelligence. The ecological systems theory. Is it D? Mm -hmm. All right, we'll go with D. Blank refers to Vygotsky's term for temporary cognitive structures or methods of solving problems that help a child as he or she learns to function independently. A? Oh, yep, scoffily. Okay. Which of the following is a difference between the nature and nurture explanations of development? Is it D? Yeah, explanations. B. 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 Okay. D is in David. D. I hear both. D. Okay, we'll go with D. D is in David. All right, Ma maturational theorists point out the that the environment, even when enriched, blank. B. B. Mm -hmm. All right. Jamal mm -hmm. is studying children's friendship patterns. He goes to an elementary school and asks the permission of parents to watch their children while they are playing in the playground. He unobtrusively sits down on a bench and records how many invitations each child receives to play and from who. In the given scenario, which of the following methods of gathering information is Jamal using? C. D. C. D. C. D. C. D. C. What? C. He's 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 he's. Uh, I'm just gonna highlight that one. He's observing. He's not talking yeah. to them, so he's not taking a survey. Right. And blank is carefully drawn out account of the behavior of an individual. Okay. 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 And blank refers to a condition in scientific study that is manipulated so that its effects can be observed. Dependent variable. Dependent. Dependent. Okay, we got one more. Why would longitudinal studies be very effective at helping to identify changes that occur as a function of the passage of time? B. B. All right. So we'll submit assignment nope. for grading. All right, let's see. So I want you guys to see what it says. You scored an 85 on this assignment, right? So mm -hmm. let's see. I got to see how, how, would it, how we go back. See, so it says here, I just want you to note, you have taken this assignment one time. You are not limited in the number of times you can take this assignment. And then you can click take it again, right? So I want to see the results here, right? So let's see. Is 
this what we had? This is the one. Nope, this is not it. This is another assessment. So there's lots of different things. I want to see my my scoring. Click on chapter one. Was it this chapter one? introduction? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Let's see. Mm -hmm. This is I why is this yeah, chapter like introduction one? It's what? It's chapter introduction. May click on that one. So this is what I want you guys to kind of get a hang of. Like I just got access to this myself, so I'm um, you know, utilizing it too, but I want you guys to get to the hang of it doing it. So what even even if we don't find it, what I want you guys to get the the hang of doing is okay, so you took it. It should be here. Let me see, maybe it's on the bottom. Here it is. Um All right, I want to see my score. It's not letting me go back. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, so like I said, let's just talk. Um, I want you guys, when you guys get access to doing this, I will figure this out too, but um, you should be able to go back and get the answer key. It should be able to give us the answer key for it. Um, Did we have to press save? Maybe, I don't know, there's. Mm, submit assignment, save, maybe it does. Well, I think you could start it. And oh, about check it. my work? Well, about... when you do check my work, um, it kind of goes, you can do this and it gives you the answer right away. So you can do both, but what I'm telling you guys, I, I, I suggest that you do is, okay, we, we got an 85, right? Or whatever our score is going to be. Um, keep testing yourselves on it until you get 100, okay? You want to get the answers. This is, they take these questions and they literally, this is the material. So they're going to reword these. The only thing that you're going to see different in the, in your midterms and your final exam is that, um, they typically put it in a question form. So all the questions will have a question mark at the end. Mm. Okay. So they put it in a certain question form that has, because that's what NCLEX does, those exams. They, they want it, they want to follow suit with it. So it's going to be a question form. And then you would so, but but it's just rewording this question in a question in a form that has the question mark at the end, not so much of a fill-in in the blank. Um there is definitely a way I have to play around with it, um, but we will go back. There's you, so this is what you're gonna see on your end. You'll be able to see this. So, and as you see, so there's also um, reading material here. Um, I saw there was a truth or fiction quiz. There's lots of different things that you can test yourself on. Chapter one review. Um, another form of a review for you guys. So, I, you know, this was just uploaded last semester. This is the first time it was uploaded for, to give you guys access to do this. It, the other students prior to never had this. And last semester, I told everybody to use it and maybe 5% of my class used it. So I'm telling you guys, you have so much resources. Utilize it, test yourselves, play around, test yourselves until you get it right. I know that there's a way to get the answers. I just have to play around with it myself. Um, um, professor, you yeah. said there's gonna be for uh, next week, next week's uh, quiz one, chapter one, two, or three for next week. Right, so next week, so we just did chapter one and two today. And if you look at the course calendar, it says that we're supposed to do two between this week and next. Um, typically each chapter takes about an hour. Okay, so we do have great time. We do great time. We went over all this. Look at look at what time it is, right? So I do want to do chat. I want to find the answers to go over with you, but I did want to do chapter two with you guys. Um, but um, next week we're gonna do chapter three, and then you guys are gonna take your quiz. We'll do, but including but, chapter three on. on so yes, yeah, so we're gonna take we're gonna review chapter three. So when we come to next week. I like it. it's questions kind of like this that like we just did, right? I'm going to start off the class with a couple of questions to review and get you guys thinking about the stuff we just talked about. 
um, quick, usually like five questions. Some may have sub questions in them, um, but it's a quick few minute thing that should take you only a couple minutes to answer. We'll go over it together and then we'll start. Um, unless there's no, if there's questions, we'll talk about questions. Then we'll start chapter three. We'll go over chapter three. After chapter three is done, um, because we already finished chapter two, we're going to probably end early next week, right? Um, I will let you guys go off and take your first quiz. Um, and you, the, your quiz will be on one, two, and three. So after we complete chapter three, then you're going to take the quiz on one, two, and three. That's your first quiz. Um, I will kind of, as you guys d download it and, 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 and start it, stay on for a little while so that you guys can, um, if you guys struggle in any way, we can just talk about it. Um, and then you guys are done. Once you take the quiz, you don't need to stay on with me. You guys are going off on your own to do the quizzes. Unless you struggle, then you send me an email or something, or I can stay on for a little bit tomorrow, um, next week. And then, um, if you finish the quiz early, we finish the class early. You understand? So as long as we cover the material and then you go off and take your quiz, we're done. So uh, next week we only um uh, take um uh, doing one chapter next week. So we yes, because we're chapter. supposed to do chapter two. It says on the calendar between um um t this week and next week because it's supposed to be a long chapter. But like I said, these chapters typically take about an hour each. Okay, so I will be implementing in the beginning of the class, just like little reviews with you guys. That's what I, that's that um, that folder, the spiral review we will do I'll upload different each week. We'll start off with that. Um, and then um, at the end, after we do chapter three, we can do some of these together. I, I have to play around with it and figure out I do want to do two with you. I don't know why. It's not giving me the answer key. Well, for the next one, we'll kind of do it a different way, but we'll do some of these together. But I want you still to go off and on your own and do these on your own time as well. OK, the reason I'm doing them with you guys is to get people used to doing it because it's something new that they put in and no one's utilizing it. And I want to show you what a great source it is. And if we could do it together, engage for a little bit, you still are going to have plenty of time before the end, you know. Mm -hmm. All right. So. Let's do a little, our little review of chapter two. Um, this time, because I can't find the answer key and I got to figure it out. I got to go back in and play, um, but we'll do check my work as we go. And then you'll, you guys can see, I want you to see how this works because it'll come up in Canvas as a grade, but you are not being graded on this. So you can take it as many times as you want. I can see how many times you take it. So I know who's trying and who's not. Right. So I, I, it doesn't mean anything to me because this is all about you. You guys are benefiting yourselves by doing this. All right. So we'll do this. We'll finish. We'll do a little recap on this and then you guys are free to go. OK. Thank you. OK. So rod shaped structures composed of genes that are formed within the nuclei of cells are called chromosomes. All right, let's, we'll do it the other way now, okay? There's two ways of doing it. Check my work, good. All right, the form of cell division in which each chromosome splits lengthwise to double in number is called? Mitosis. Mitosis, someone else said meiosis. Mitosis. Okay. A. There you go, mitosis. A. Okay, meiosis is also known as? Reduction of division. All right. You guys are doing great. Which of the following is a difference between monozygotic and dizygotic twins? D. E? D, you said? B, as in D. E. Okay. D? E? No, it's. It's D. It's D. Um, D is, oh, it's A. B. It's C. <laughs> C. C. <laughs> so this is the other way to do it. And you can keep guessing until you get it right. Um, so C. C. Monozygotic twins are derived from a single zygote that has split into two, where dizygotic twins are derived from two zygotes. 
Mm -hmm. This is what I want you guys to get used to seeing that you can do it two ways. You could submit a grading. I I have to find out why I didn't get the answer key, but we'll go over that next week. Um, But you can also just cheat and check my work. But I want you to practice on your own and learn it. We did. This was the one we just did. Yes. All right. Froze on me. Jane gave birth at the same time, which uh, Jane gave birth at the same time. Two daughters who were developed from two ova produced in the same month and fertilized by different spell cells. The daughters have a 50% genetic overlap with each other. Jane's daughters are blank twins. Mono. Mm-hmm. No, D. That's, no, that's D. 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 Okay. Mm-hmm. The Izygotic twins. Good. So, so what they do in it, what I'm saying to you is that you see how they put the blank here in the mm-hmm. midterm exam or the final exam. They're just going to say Jane's daughters are which type of twins. Mm-hmm. They're not going to put that blank. They're just going to ask you it in a question form. So this is why I say review these things because this is the same types of questions you're going to have. All right. So we checked our work. We're going to the next one. Kirk works as a stressful job for long hours. He frequently has headaches, fatigue, and blurred vision, as well as increased thirst and hunger. He remembers that his father and older brother suffered from the same symptoms and suffered from diabetes. He visits a doctor where he is also diagnosed with the, with the same. In this scenario, Kirk's condition as an example of... A. 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 Mm-hmm. Normality. Incorrect. D. D. D as in D. David. D as in David. Factual. Multifactorial problems, right? So multifactorial because um he's got all these things, right? And then also diabetes. So that's that's multi, that's multiple symptoms. Which of the following is true of males who suffer from Klinefelter syndrome? Uh, C. No, they don't produce C. A. Let's go for that. Not A. No. Their primary and secondary sex characteristics do not develop properly. <laughs> Remember, Kleinerfelter syndrome, right? I told you the two of the two women, the ma- male and female, they also are suffer from infertility. infertility. Yep. Matt and Lynn do do not have cystic fibrosis. However, their son is born with cystic fibrosis. Matt and Lynn. Okay. Okay. D. 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 David. All right. Let's see. Incorrect. It's B. B as in boy. Our carriers yes, in oh, yeah. the disease. All right. So carriers of recessive genes causing the disease. So remember, what we're talking about is that it's not just Matt and it's not just Lynn, because then one of them is has a dominant gene. It's Matt and Lynn together. Yeah. Okay. So that's the only the difference. So you do want to review that a little bit, recessive genes um, and the difference there. So that's another thing too. Um, what I suggest is if you do take these tests or test yourselves and you know you get something wrong, go back and test, re, uh, re- review that pe- portion of the textbook because you know that's yeah. something you need to review. Which of the following is a difference between genotypes and phenotypes? I don't remember this at all. <laughs> it, this, this is what's going to happen. Yeah, B. 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 Genotypes are sets of traits that were that we inherit from our parents, where phenotypes are the actual sets of traits that we exhibit, right? Um, so uh that was where I kind of gave you the example of my son with the blonde hair too. Um mm-hmm. he he actually exhibits the trait. 
he doesn't just get it. Um, so someone said, oh, I don't remember this at all. This is what's going to happen when we get to chapter 10 or nine. And you were like, what? I don't remember what we did in chapter one. So this <laughs> is why I you're like, I, I, I really, you know, keep reviewing this stuff. Don't just do it once and not. Yeah. OK, because when we get in, we have 19 chapters. When you get further down the line, you're going to be like, what did we even talk about in chapter one? I don't remember this day. You're doing so great now, right? Mm -hmm. All right? So Jeremy is a student who is studying about genotypes and similarities in behavior patterns and traits in families. He talks to different families to compare how many similar people are, how similar people are, and notices that parents and children seem quite similar with respect to the degree which they display similarities in terms of certain behavioral traits. Aunts and uncles display somewhat less similarity than their nieces and nephews. First cousins display even less similarity than each other. What sort of study is Jeremy conducting? Kinship study? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, very smart. And I really hope they don't give you a long question like that. Jeez. Um, I don't think that they will because that's a mm -hmm. lot of stuff and it's very confusing. I think they kind of try to mm -hmm. stick to the point. Um, but you guys got it. Okay, which of the following is true of Ova? Hey. Over are much larger than sperm. Good job. Which of the following is true of sperm that enter a woman's vagina? C? Mm -hmm. eight. Eight. One yeah. of one thousand. Out of the sperm, um, in the oh, egg, one. Day, only oh, yeah. one can oh, fertilize yeah. the ovum successfully. Yeah. Injection of sperm into the uterus to fertilize an ovum is known as insemination. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Tara and Sean are trying to conceive a baby, but they are infertile. So Tara has had eggs harvested and the eggs have been placed in a Petri dish where they are to be fertilized using some of Sean's sperm. Soon those fertilized ova will be injected into Tara's uterus. In this scenario, Tara and Sean are using which type? Well, in vitro. In vitro. All right. In vitro. Mm -hmm. Which of the following is true of pre-implantation genetic diagnosis? Um, C. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Yep. Mm -hmm. We talked about you can choose your sex, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, during the germinal period of prenatal development, the zygote has the form of a sperm, a spear of cells surrounding a cavity of fluid, which is called? Blastocyte. Blastocyte we're going with? Okay. It is blastocyte, right? So, you, you know, that's another thing, narrowing them down. The blank is the plate-like inner part of the blastocyte that differentiates in the ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm of the embryo. Two. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's two. Okay. No, I can't remember. All right, we'll go. I'm taking a three. No. Hey. B. B. Is the B. There you go. Embryonic. Yeah. So yeah, it, it's okay. You know, like I said, what we're doing right here is helping um with your short and long-term memory. Doing this each class is gonna help a lot. One study analyzed the results of several other studies regarding the use of marijuana during pregnancy and found that pregnant women who used the drug were more likely to develop blank than those pregnant women who did not. Spontaneous abortion. Spontaneous abortion. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Eight. 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 Oh, anemia. Wait. First of all, wait. Anemia. Mm -hmm. Abortion is when you marijuana. I mean anemia. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> keep in mind, don't let the there there will be trick questions like this, right? Spontaneous abortion. Abortion is um it, you you choose to go have an abortion, right? So it's not you, you by do, this. You're not. This is not a choice. This is happening. The they're having the baby. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Which of the following is a difference between cephaclodal and proximodistal trends? Trends. <sighs> E. D, you said? No. C is in cat. C, C, C. Okay. <sighs> head in. Yeah. That's right. Right. So, development of head to the feet and then the outer coming out. That's suffocloto and proxima distal. And 20. Catherine is pregnant with her first child and has just started to feel the first of what will be many fetal movements. With only this information, one could draw the conclusion that Catherine is how for, far along in the pregnancy? Um, four month? In the middle. I know it's 13 weeks. In the middle. <laughs> <laughs> you got it in the middle right so keep in mind if you're not sure know that at the end the baby stops moving because of this cramp inside right because it's cramped inside so you it's it's got to happen right before the end right so mm -hmm. then you narrow down your options there all right so we 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 cheated on this one and we got we made sure we could click all the correct answers so obviously when i submit the assignment for grading Let's see, you said, someone said try saving. I'm gonna do both, but I'm gonna submit it for grading. And um, I don't no. get, it, it's possible that, I mean, it graded it for us. And even though don't, it says count storage grade, it does not. So don't let anybody, you know, show. I don't know why. It says zero points. I it didn't even submit. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, so it it this thing calculates. So when when it goes here, you'll see like a recent activity in grade book. Um, it'll kind of calculate. Um, your own percentage, your average score. It'll kind of do that here. Uh, if you take all these tests and see how you do. Um, like I said, you can take these over and over again. Oh. There it goes. It should, it jumped in here. Um, so there's different things that you can do. You can retake these a million times. It doesn't matter. Um, we'll do a couple of these, right? So depending on our time, um, we're going to do exactly what I said. We'll go over the chapters. We'll do this first to, together as a class because I want everybody to get into the flow of doing it. Um, and seeing what the answers are. And then I'll let you guys go off and do your, your quizzes. So this week you don't have a quiz. Um, and if you guys don't have any questions, you guys are free to go. Thank you. Question, Professor. Ask questions. If you have them, ask, go ahead. Okay. I, so I wasn't here at the beginning. Um, I did go on my phone to get to, what's it? The Google, the, the drive. Right. But I was trying to figure out how to get to the quiz, the test through that, because it comes up as eight download, eight class recording. Okay. Live. So um, whatever you missed, and this is why I'm doing this too, when um, probably by tomorrow, I'll have the our class, whole class recording in this folder. So you can go back and watch the video and see what you missed. Okay. okay. Um, but how do I get to the quiz, the practice quiz? Okay. So that's in, Can this is in Canvas. Oh, okay. Then it's I'm in Canvas. You have to get the textbook and create the account first. Okay. So when you get the textbook, um, like I said, if I close this out um, and you go into it, you, it, you typically you would go into modules 
And if you go into modules, each week, so each week has your assignments, right? So you can see practice quiz, chapters one and two, week two, review materials, it gives you everything. Week three, week four, week five, you have all of your weeks of what we're gonna be going over, your assignments that are due. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, these are all the chapters stuff, right? For Cengage. So it's actually at the bottom. So the practice quizzes that we just, the practice test that we just did, it's down here. It's all the way down at the bottom here. Got you. That's what I wanted to find. Yeah. So you got to go all the way down. You have to actually go past our week 12 mm -hmm. and then you'll have access to all of these. Um, once it'll take you right to it, it's going to tell you to create an account with the code from your textbook. You create the account. And then once you click on these, it just, it's going to kind of do what it did for me. Log you guys, you could just keep logging back in. Um, and it keeps the calculation of your scores and, you got to play around with it. It's new to me too. So I'm learning it. Um, but we'll do it together too, as a class. So I'll figure all that out. Um, and then you can go back and do this as many times as you guys want. Right. Thank okay. you. Question. Mm -hmm. Question. Yes. How many question is the quiz? Like the weekly quiz? Good question. All the quizzes will have 20 questions. So typically most of our weeks are based on, on two chapters. Most of them are. So that means it would be like, if divided between the 20 questions, if it's two chapters, then it'll be 10 questions per chapter. If it's three chapters, then it'll be probably six or seven questions per chapter. Okay. Um, All right. Thank you. We, we'll do this review stuff right before, and your goal is to try and do your best that you can, right? So you, you guys are doing this at home on your own time. You can have those textbooks open. Um, you you want to do well on them and you want to make sure that you do them because every point counts at the very end. And, you know, um, like I said, we, I, I kind of did to like a little bit after we kind of flowed into a little bit after 7.30, typically around that time, we'll take a, like a little pause. Um, if you guys think that you need more time, please let me know. Um, also, um, I'm going to do, cause yes, and I know and I, it's, it, everybody's contradicting of it, but I'd like to let you guys out early. I want you guys to, you know, go do what you need to do on your own time. If we cover the material, like I said, each chapter typically is like an hour and then you're going off to do um, an hour quiz. So really you, you want, and then you can have that little extra free time for yourselves. Um, but in the, the, hour, the quiz is for, the quiz is an hour. It, it may take you, you may finish it quicker. But no, uh, uh, hours a time limit that we get. Um, yes, it's typically about you get it like a time limit. Most people, from what I was told, don't need the hour. Basically, what we just did that didn't take us an hour. Oh, uh, the quiz is due the same day, so it's due the same day. Yeah, okay. okay, is is the is the open book quizzes or no? Or is you, that... yeah, you're taking this at home. I can't see what you're doing okay. at home. So open your book. Right. You want to do well. Open that book. Find the answers. Listen, at the end of the day, what I care, what I really am telling you, I recommend that you do is keep reviewing the material. OK, you review, 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 because when it comes down to it, um, you can cheat all you want. But if you're not studying and reviewing, you are not passing those midterms and those finals. OK, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. So. Um, what you do on your own time, whatever what you do, that's on you. But you have, I mean, I think, I hope that this is enough stuff for you to review with. You have this, this Cengage stuff, and then you have all the stuff that I've given you in here. Um, and as I develop new material, I always put it in here and then tell you about it. So um, we'll do something similar to this. This is what I, I kind of did um, last semester for our, our midterm and final reviews. Is it a uh, a, like a, a test I created a test and then we um, we answered them and did the same thing and I think just doing this together as a group is is great it, it, it re helps you refresh your mind we're interacting instead of just listening to me um you know we, we have our moments of me listening to me lecture but stop me at any point if you get stuck or you don't understand something in the lectures mm -hmm. okay. where we can find those cards for study like the packets card you said you have some Okay, so great. That's a good question. Um, so in the review material, you have all these things here. If you go all the way down um, to the bottom, um, lifespan index um, card printouts, right? Oh, so I see. It may, depending on what you do, if you have your own printers or you go somewhere to print it mm -hmm. out, it may be a little bit, you know, because there's a lot of pages. But mm -hmm. um, 
a lot of people who've taken these uh, that took the quiz, the class, I've taken, I ask questions at the end to see how people do well and have done very well with this. Like having, they create their own. So I created this for you. I always recommend because when you're creating your own and you're rewriting it, you're helping yourself memorize the terms because you're taking notes. Yes, yes. Um, so this is on the website, on what do you call This it? is on the Google Drive. You have this. I'm going to send you guys an email out tomorrow, most likely by tomorrow. Um, and it's going to, in that email, basically, um, you're going to have to save that email somewhere. But basically, is going to be this welcome letter. And I really, like, I hope you guys read it. Um, it gives you all the information about our class um, the and the different features that we use and stuff like that and, and assignments and stuff. And in it at the top is our class and then the Zoom, the Zoom link and then the Google Drive. So you, you save that email instead of asking me every week, hey, I lost that link. You just save the email and you'll have it. Okay, so this is what I'm basically going to be emailing you guys. I have to wait. I usually wait till the day that I meet you guys because um, most of you and you know who you are didn't sign up for the course or agree to the course until like this morning. So I don't get your email until you sign up and agree to the course. So I don't I, I have to wait until I get everybody's emails. And like I said, you guys know who you are, who clicked on it this morning and, fi and finally opened up Canvas. So Yes. Well, it wasn't available. It well, I had your names, but it said that you didn't accept the course. So whoever was, but it wasn't available. It wasn't actually, it keeps telling us that it wasn't available. The class hasn't started. Ah, yeah. Yeah. So it it was a handful of people, but these are the these are the things that um always we always have problems with electronics, right? There's always some kind of thing. Look at how many people had trouble getting into the class. It happens. Yeah. Email me and keep me updated if you do have any struggles with anything so that we can communicate and I can try and help you in any way. And like I said, the last thing I want to take is a note to you guys is that I'm going to be utilizing the announcements and discussion boards. So I posted a discussion board in here. It's an, a little introduction of myself. And I, you know, I'd like when you guys during the week, if you want to take some time and just like do a little introduction to yourself so I can get to know you guys a little bit better. Um, and we can all say hello, kind of say hello to each other. And then I'm going to start putting announcements in here, maybe like once or twice a week, since I don't see you all week with reminders. Maybe I'll give you guys a little video recap of some of the material we did. So you'll get a notification probably to your phone that I posted an announcement and it's up to you whether you want to read them or click on them. Okay. Um, any other questions? No. We're good. Thank you. If you have no questions, like I said, you guys are free to go. You can hang around. Um, have a great week. It was great meeting and seeing you all of you. And I hope to, and I'm looking forward to seeing you again next week. And any questions during the week, email me, okay? okay. Thank, thank, thank you. you have, a have a great evening. You're welcome. Have a great evening. Bye, everybody. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.